Net proceeds from our show, Sports Medicine Weekly, go to support orthopedic research at Rush through the liveactivenow.org fund. Welcome back, everyone. Sports Medicine Weekly on this Saturday morning. Steve Cashel with you along with Dr. Charles Bush Joseph filling in this week for Dr. Brian Cole. And Dr. Chuck was the head team physician for the Chicago White Sox for 15 years. He now is one of the... uh, Team physicians for the White Sox, as Dr. Nick Verma took his place as the head guy, so to speak. Is that the right way to put it, Doc? Yeah, you know, Nick is that guy that gets that first phone call. And uh, I did it for 15 years, and uh, uh, I get to sleep in a little bit more now. Good, good, good. You know, I've got a question because we're getting ready for spring training in less than a month now. And there's still talk about free agents and trades and everything else. Let's talk about it, Doc, if we can, on the medical side. All right, let's say the White Sox bring over a free agent. What happens then about the medical records? Do you get in talk, contact with that team, the last team they played for with their team physician? Do you go to their family physician? you get the full medical work? And here's my question. Do you get to examine them? You know, Steve, things have changed over the 15 years. So when we started back in 2003, Major League Baseball was only on paper records. They were hard. They were dispersed. You couldn't find them all. And really, we went to a unified medical record, similar to like we have at Rush University Medical Center. And all the teams basically have to provide all their care into the record. So when we're looking at a free agent, uh, we're, we actually have the opportunity to review their entire medical record in their minor league and major league career. And then in addition to that, obviously, we do the due, due diligence. We're going we're gonna to talk to their training staff from the prior teams. Usually, I'm going to talk personally to the head team physician of the team where that player last was. So we get to look at them. We look at all the medical records. We get to examine them even after negotiations have been concluded about a free agent. And then we'll do our complete physical. We'll get them over to Rush. We're going to MRI them up. We're going to examine them. We'll get our internist and all our subspecialists. We'll look at any particular problems before we sign. And then Dr. Verma, myself, or whoever, we'll give the high sign to Rick Hahn and say, yeah, we're, right. we're, we're all in. Now, trades are different in Major League Baseball. In Major League Baseball, when if we're trading for a player, we're accepting a player that's already under contract. We don't have that ability to examine them and void the trade. What we can do is we, again, look at all their medical records, talk to the team physician, and see is there any co- sort of disqualifying condition that's going on with the player. And then we can sometimes put on a uh, a rider, well, we won't, accept the trade or void the trade until we examine the player. Now, sometimes the other team will grant that. Sometimes they won't. So, you know, clearly we want to do our diligence. Uh, These are very expensive assets, as as the team will call them. Uh, On the minor league side, we're we're not as diligent. You know, we still go through the records, but, you know, many times we'll sort of accept the player it is. So when we're trading a major league player for uh, three or four minor leaguers, We'll do the diligence, but oftentimes those players we're not examining to the same degree. It's interesting. It's almost like real estate. You're taking a house then instead of bringing in a, a consultant or someone to examine the house, right? Uh, you're doing as is on trades. I never knew that. I thought yeah. you could examine the player. Maybe it's different in other sports because sometimes in the NBA or maybe pro football, you're, you're seeing that they didn't pass their physical, so the trade didn't go through, but you're taking as is. Yeah, on the free agent side, we get to examine them, but in most trade situations, it's as is, because usually the other teams are saying, listen, you've got to take them as is. You know, I mean, you know, and usually, you know, if we're talking about players who are in the back end of their career, they're in their early 30s, they've had a bunch of surgeries, a bunch of findings on MRIs, it's, it's you know, there's a lot of things we're going to make judgment calls. Now, I can tell you, I there's many times over my 15 years with the Sox where I voided or vetoed trades, and sometimes I made the right decision. I'll be honest with you, sometimes I made the wrong decision. There were players that I thought that they had what I felt would be disqualifying medical conditions who went on and played another four or five years in the major leagues and had pr- productive seasons. Uh, and there sometimes I made the right decision and, and certainly gave myself a good pat on the back. So. There you go. Uh, maybe the biggest injury in Chicago right now, the left thumb injury to Wendell Carter Jr., our Bulls rookie center, suffers the injury in the game against the Lakers on January 15th. And uh, just this past week, the Bulls hand specialist, Dr. John Fernandez and Mark Cohen, uh, did surgery on Wendell Carter. So what? tell me, uh, we don't have to talk specifics about Wendell, we know he's out for the season, but uh, how is this? Tell me about the surgery and what the actual injury is on a, on a weekend warrior. You know, this is real similar to what Joe Kim Noah underwent several years ago. Again, a bull center, 
prominent player in the organization. Wendell's a little bit more in the development phase, so it's a little disappointing that he's going to lose that rest of this season for his development time. You know, it's a, the thumb ligament, we, which in the old days we would call the gamekeeper's thumb, and now we call it ski pole thumb. You know, it's uh, the l- th- uh, ligament on the inside where your thumb hits your index finger. And if you jam that and jam it hard and you can pull that ligament right off the bone, it doesn't heal very well because the ligament flips out over the top of muscle and can't stick back down. Mm. So we find that nowadays the more predictable recovery is if you reattach that ligament. And so it's done surgically. It's an outpatient surgery, not a big deal. But still, ligaments take about eight weeks to heal and about another six to eight weeks of recovery from motion and strength. So it ends up being a 12 to 16-week kind of injury, which unfortunately you know, you know, can be a season ending for many players. Now, a lot of the weekend warriors will treat it non-operatively. Um, and unfortunately, if that's the case, they usually have a loose thumb for a while and be quite sensitive. And I, I have personal experience on that. I did injure mine in a church league basketball game and regretted that I did not have it surgically repaired. It took a while, right? It was almost a year before I stopped getting those, quote, zingers uh, if I didn't catch the ball just right or it hit my thumb and I would just hit the ground kind of thing. Do so, baseball players get that injury at all? Baseball players can get it either acutely or chronically. I, mean, I think we were, you and I were speaking, or speaking earlier. Of, you know, Paul Canerco had a chronic gamekeepers, and uh, it was a chronic problem for him. We had to do all kinds of special taping and bracing. Um, he had slowly stretched that ligament out over the course of many years, uh, whereas in, in, in you know, Joe Kim Noah and Wendell Carter, it was an acute injury. Never a better time to fix it with an acute injury. Fixing it when it's a chronically injured, not nearly as predictable. Canerco never wanted the surgery. No, Paul, because we said, you know, he said, I'll play through the season with it, which you always did. That was Paul. And then at the end of the season, you know, time to get your thumb fixed. No, I, I think I'm okay. It's the off season. I, I want to go play golf. <laughs> That's great. Time now for our Ask the Doctor segment with Dr. Chuck Bush Joseph. I'm Steve Cashel. It's Sports Medicine Weekly. It's very simple, folks. You want to ask the doc a question here in our segment that we do every week. Just go to the Homepage on our website, sportsmedicineweekly.com. You'll find the picture of Dr. Brian Cole and myself on the right side. Click on that link, and you can ask the doctor. Here we go, Doc. Question number one from Mark asking you this. Can you describe the treatment protocol for tennis elbow? When should a patient seek treatment? You know, the general rule of thumb on tennis elbow, it's a little bit like rotator cuff tendonitis. It's where the tendon comes off of the bone for your forearm muscles, and if it gets injured, Many times it heals. Majority of time it heals. So, you know, if you have an overuse event, you're working, you're doing a lot of work around the house, uh, and an elbow flares up, yeah, you give it 48, 72 hours and just see how it responds. And, and so certainly when these things go on for more than 7 to 10 days and you got local tenderness and weakness on grip strength activities, turning a doorknob or trying to pick up something heavy, uh, and that's just not going away, then we start to get a little bit more nervous. Most importantly is night pain. Patients who have difficulty with sleeping, it wakes them up at night, persistent for more than 7, 10 days, 2 weeks, that's when we say it probably should be evaluated. All right, second question uh, comes from uh, Jimmy on the north side. What are the signs that muscle soreness shouldn't be ignored? You know, if you see significant bruising or ecchymosis, as we would say, where there's a, you know, you felt a pop and then sec- secondarily you see redness and swelling in that area or you can feel a palpable gap, that would make us nervous. If you just are sore, you know, you did something excessively, you sprinted or ran when you hadn't ran in a while, or you did a, an immediate, what we say, a ballistic moves when you, you've been just doing light recreational things, uh, muscle soreness for 48, 72 hours, again, very normal. Doc, thanks so much for joining us this week. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Appreciate it. Many thanks to our producer, Shane Reardon. Our coordinating producer is Teresa Ann Seeger. Also want to thank David Cole for managing the website and our business operations, as well as Samantha Smith from Midwest Orthopedics at Rush. For Dr. Charles Bush Joseph, subbing for Dr. Brian Cole, my name is Steve Cashel saying so long, and thanks for listening to Sports Medicine Weekly here on 670. The score up next on The Score. Early Odds with Joe Ostrowski. Talk with you again next week. Have a great Saturday, everybody.